uh, you will not um, reduce healthcare costs over the years after bariatric surgery. So why is it is the number of patients emerging obesity? It has almost doubled since the late 80s, last century. It is a global health concern. It's also an economic burden. The secondary cause is due to obese people. Bariatric surgery is considered an effective method for immediate and ongoing weight reduction. We know that we have favorable effect on cardiovascular and endocrinological benefits. But there is also clear cause for concern on bone metabolism and a possible increased fracture risk in the future. Furthermore, as we already know, bariatric surgery is rapidly and ongoing associated with an increased risk of high bone turnover. High bone turnover, especially in states of postmenopausal osteoporosis, but also in glucocorticoid-induced osteoporosis, is a clearly unfavorable effect for bone metabolism and bone microarchitecture. And still, we don't know what happens with the endocrinological organ called bone after an irreversible operation in the intestine, in the intestinal tract. So the, the role of, of key proteins like sclerostin, chiefly produced by osteocytes, as a key regulator for bone formation is currently still a little bit unknown. Just to look at our national data in Austria, approximately 12% of the population aged 15 years and older are considered obese, reflected by a body mass index that is above 30 kilograms per square meters. If we look at the gender distribution, we have a little bit more obese female than male population in Austria. You can see here a sample from our DXA machine, from our uh, bone mineral density scan that we also can perform. The total body scan, you see here the, the red areas representing uh, body fat part above 60% uh, and more. If we look at uh, statistical data from the National Governmental Society of Austria, we see, and I have to apologize, this is in Germany, uh, we see over year 2009 to 2013 a continuous increase of bariatric surgeries in the female population, but we also see this increase in the male population. If we look at the gender distribution of this uh, population, we see that approximately 75% of the people, of these patients, are females, while there are 25% male population undergoing bariatric surgery. Uh, there are different types of, of bariatric surgery. These are the two most common types performed, not only in Austria, but also in, in Europe and in the US. On the left side of the slide, you see the, the RU bypass, the RYGB, and on the right side, the sleeve crestectomy. Uh, let's go quick through the slide. You see here the esophagus, you see a pouch, the rest of the stomach, and you see a deep anastomosis in the lower intestine. So, on the right side, you see the sleeve gastrectomy here. You just have a small pouch and no, no, uh, no uh, gastro is, is left. And here you can see an upper anastomosis and a deep anastomosis. However, the pouch is, has an approximate volume ranging from 15 to 50 up to 100 milliliters. Um, when I first saw this slide, I, out of a book, a surgical book, I, I had a problem to realize the amount or the less amount, what is really 100 milliliters. Um, then I saw a bottle for a newborn baby, to feed a newborn baby. And this is sometimes less than 100 milliliters for a newborn baby, if you feed a baby at the age of one or two months. Um, this is the rest of the stomach in a patient with a body mass index above 40, up to 50, up to 60. And it's impossible uh, for these patients to eat more. And it's impossible to reverse this surgical procedure. It is absolutely impossible um, to, to re-operate the patient and to put another stomach on the left side because you guys no stomach left. So I see a lot of patients prior to the operation. I'm an internist and I have to check if they are susceptible or it's okay. 
if there are any contraindications for the surgical procedure. And I even tell people, why do you want to do this? It's, it's irre irreversible. But um, I can tell you, it's, it's hard to convince people to look for other strategies to reduce body weight in that context. Here you can see one of our study patients um, who underwent a bariatric surgery. The bariatric surgery, the initial surgery was in March 2015. And then we made a follow-up within the study in the time point of 12 to 13 months. And we performed a total body DXA scan. As you can see in the upper right part of the slide, the initial BMI was close to 42. And after 13 months, um, the patient lost 50%. Now the BMI is 19.3. Um, it's obvious that this operation is effective. What happened? We can see here, the person, she's a lady, she had 100 kilograms initially and then she lost, she went down to 47 kilograms. Um, she lost from 53 kilograms down, she went down to 12 kilograms of fat. But on the other side, she also lost um, body lean mass. She lost approximately 40% of the body lean mass. And this is a side effect that should be taken into account. You will not only leave uh, fat, but you will also leave uh, lean mass, which, as we heard from your talk just right now, has uh, vigorous um, effects on your future life. Next thing we have to discuss is bariatric surgery in adolescent and young people, in young and obese people. As we all know, the number of young uh, obese people is dramatically increasing. It affects approximately 4.4 million children and adolescents in the United States. It's like quite, quite recent uh, data. Um, few effective strategies and treatment options are available for this population. Um, it's hard for, for, the, for a young child or for an adolescent that is clearly obese to change lifestyle, to change eating behavior, to start and perform muscle exercise. Um, this should be done not only for two weeks, for six weeks, for eight weeks, it should be done for the whole lifetime. So prevention strategies um, take a long time and they are sometimes uh, not that cheap. Particular concern is centered on health problems among severely obese adolescents and therefore one approach could be the surgical procedure. Um, we know data from the US, very recent data, that uh, adolescent bariatric surgery the case volumes doubled from approximately 800 cases in 2003 uh, to 1,600 cases in 2009. And the curve is increasing with the number of adolescents. Um, last week on Wednesday, I had a very strange feeling. I, I watched television and ORF, it's the Austrian Broadcasting Corporation, the National Broadcasting Corporation, and there was a um, I was at, at 8.15 p.m., so it's the main time to watch television. Uh, there was um, a discussion about adolescents, uh, how they behave right now, what are their problems. And one of the problems was obesity. And this is the same boy, he's at the age of 14. On the upper side, you see him prior to the bariatric surgery. Never, no one ever tried any coping strategy to reduce weight. He or let's say his parents found a surgeon that made a who bypass. And as you see him um, at the live interview in the studio in the Austrian Broadcast Corporation, it was, as you can see in the slide, on October 19th at 2015. Um, I then asked also the, the Broadcasting Corporation and I, I got a lot of bad feelings and a bad feedback because in that case, they showed that this should be one of the most, uh, the best solution for obese children uh, to lose weight and have a good life. What they did not show is that how their life changes. I will go and, and will bring you some uh, some details. What should be taken into account if you perform a bariatric surgery to to stay with these patients and to look for these patients? What are their problems? Not only on bone metabolism. This New England Journal paper was recently published uh, about US data on bariatric surgery, 228 patients. The two most common uh, surgical procedures, as I already mentioned in the beginning of my talk, 
And we can see also in the US, like in Austria, we have the same gender distribution of approximately 75% female and 25% male patients. And this is also my personal opinion, uh, patients undergoing bariatric surgery are normally from um, lower income. I very seldom have people with high income who want to have a bariatric surgery. Normally they are from, from, from society uh, with lower education and lower income and very, they think that all their problems will be solved with just one operation. One of the favorite effects I already showed you in one of my previous slides that there is a decline in weight change on the left side of the slide regardless of the type of surgery, regardless of, of gastric bypass or root bypass. And uh, dyslipidemia, this is also a cause of concern, you lower your cardiovascular risk and you also lower your risk of type, type 2 diabetes, which is quite easy. Type 2 diabetes is acquired by eating too much, improving, enhancing all the, 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 the body liquids. If you cannot eat and remember that the abdominal pouch in the upper gastrointestinal tract is about 100 milliliters, so you cannot eat anything. So from the surgical approach, um, the gastric bypass is the best way to prevent type 2 diabetes. So let's go on. What are the side effects? You have after the operation, if you don't take micronutrition, if you don't take vitamin D prophylaxis, if you don't take protein powder, if you don't take calcium, you have problems with vitamin B12, you have problems with your, with your iron metabolism, so you have changes in your, in your red blood cell count, you will come towards an anemia. It is not the first patient that we see in our clinic that needs blood transfusions in order to maintain the, the red blood cell levels. You also, what the people don't have normally is vitamin D problems. Right now we, we enhance and we, also, we, we are able to convince our surgical colleagues to um, maintain vitamin D levels. The authors in this study also looked on PTH levels, interestingly, and I have over the last year seen a lot of patients with severe vitamin D deficiency and obesity, but with normal uh, serum calcium levels, with normal IPTH levels. So PTH is not a good indicator for bone health and bone metabolism in this specific population. Uh, and on the other hand, what is uh, after the surgery? The, they looked up to three years after the surgical, surgical procedure. Here are two types. I just want to focus you on the number of events and the event rate, what will happen after bariatric surgery, further intra-abdominal operations, further endoscopic procedures, uh, dilation of strictures, and uh, a lot of upper gastrointestinal endoscopic procedures in order to look why these people feel uncomfortable. So to conclude, bariatric surgery in a very young population, we have, like in the older population, significant improvements in weight, in cardiometabolic health, and in weight-related quality of life the first three years of the bariatric surgery. However, on the other side, risks associated with bariatric surgery include specific micronutrition deficiencies and the need for additional abdominal procedures. The problem of bariatric surgery in, in the adolescent period we see the growth, the bone growth period. You can see, you can see normally this is the period where you gain bone, bone structure, bone microarchitecture and bone mineral density. And if you uh, perform bariatric surgery at that stage, you will have a problem. You might never gain a real good peak bone mass that you need for the next decades of your life. So let's come to our own data, the BUPS studies, the bone metabolism after bariatric surgery. The BUPS 1 study uh, focused on premenopausal women, only women, who just got the operation, either the root bypass or the gastric um, procedure, and uh, we tested the hypothesis that either the root bypass or the sleep gastrectomy in obese young women severely influenced bone metabolism, area bone mineral density and body composition. 
and we looked on specific markers of bone metabolism and osteocyte, osteoblast and osteoclast activity. Uh, the novelty of our study that we looked on, on sclerostin on DCOP1 as um, proteins chiefly produced by osteocytes, uh, either enhancing or lowering bone metabolism and also well-known formation and resorption marker. And the study uh, was about 24 months beginning from the operation. And we also looked at changes of aerial bone mineral density at the lumbar spine, at the total hip, which means trabecular and cortical bone sites, but also looked on, on body composition and total body BMD in total body DXA scans. Uh, this was our baseline study population. We had um, 52 female patients with the root bypass and 38 with the sleeve gastrectomy. The median age was around 40. Um, proportion of fat, 50% fat. A median body mass index clearly above 40. In Austria, the operation is fully reimbursed if you have a body mass index 40 or above and no risk factors or you have a body mass index of 35 and risk factors such as severe hypertension, such as severe hyperlipidemia, or such as uh, type 2 diabetes. If you look at uh, baseline bone turnover markers, uh, they are all, interestingly, they are all in the range of normal, except the vitamin D levels, they were clearly uh, below the recommended threshold of 20 or 30, depending on which guideline you will uh, cite. But also here, the CTX levels, despite, despite uh, this low vitamin D level and a slightly elevated, but in a PTH level, the upper limit of normal, we did not observe any high bone turnover. Interestingly, this is not shown on the slide, all these patients have a low-grade inflammation. A lot of fat means a lot of low-grade inflammation, which is represented by continuous elevation of high-sensitive C-reactive protein. If we look at bone mineral density, which is reflected also by the body weight um, of more than 100 kilograms, you can see um, rather high values uh, is expressed as grams per square centimeters. Now let's see what will happen after the operation. These are always um, data up to 24 months. In the first six months, we made it at month one, three, and six, and then month nine, 12, 18, and 24. You see the two groups in red, the root bypass, and in blue, the sleeve gastrectomy. The dotted horizontal lines indicate the range of normal. You can see, if you look at sclerostin, produced by osteocytes, the endogenous inhibitor of, of osteoblast action. As you are aware, sclerostin antibody will be launched as a new osteoporosis drug, um, probably in the next year. And you see a vast increase of sclerostin levels. An increase, a plateau of after six to nine months, and then a slight decline, regardless of the type of surgery. In contrast, we saw a slight decrease over time, then an increase, like a wave pattern of DCOP1. It's also an endogenous inhibitor. It's produced by osteocytes, but not exclusively by osteocytes. And then we look at the CTX levels, at the osteoclast marker levels. The very known osteoclast markers that we measure for osteoporosis, for osteoporosis treatment, and for osteoporosis treatment success. And we saw from the relatively low level, from the relatively low turnover uh, of osteoclast activity, we saw an increase up to 12 months. And then we saw a plateau lasting until month 24 when we stopped our study. And here, this is the upper range of the normal limit of our lab kit. Interestingly, uh, P1 and P, the osteoblast marker, also increased uh, to a higher niveau, but this P1 and P levels remained within normal range. So if you look at these two together, you can see, of course, there's an increase in P1 and P, but there's a more increase in CTX, resulting in a net deficit uh, in bone metabolism and increased bone activity. Here we can see the aerial BMD body composition measurements. BMD total body reflecting a total skeleton from the skull until the toes in the, in the total body DXA scan. We saw a continuous decrease over time. We saw the same decrease at cortical bone size reflected by the hip. Um, 
if you can see here this continuous decline of total body BMD, there is also one striking argument from the positive point of view for bariatric surgery that the skeleton has adaptive effects to the new body weight. So the BMD must decline. I can understand if we look at the hip, at the vertebral body, where we can see that there is a decline due to the reduced body weight. But if you can see here the total body BMD, this is weight-bearing and non-weight-bearing bone side, uh, I do not see any, any striking argument why this is an adaptive process of the skeleton to the new body weight. We can see that's what we want, the reduction of body weight, but on the other hand, we can see a continuous decline in body lean mass with really vigorous and negative influence for the physical, mental and bone health for all these patients. Then we look in a statistical model, what is the most striking discriminator uh, for the loss of bone mineral density, either at the hip or the lumbar spine and the trabecular bone areas, or, as I already mentioned, BMD total body. And of course we saw that the loss of bone mineral density is, is a very striking discriminator, but we also saw that the, this vast and ongoing increase of sclerostin levels in the serum after bariatric surgery is a very high discriminator also CTX levels, and interestingly, a slight, we also observed a slight increase in serum phosphate levels. Although these people clearly had no renal problems, and we are aware of this, uh, that a slight increase of serum phosphate has negative effects on bone matrix and bone matrix quality, and probably increases the risk for fragility fractures. Okay, we did, this, this study was never designed to, to to look at fracture risk, we had about 90, uh, 90 patients for 24 months, so you cannot make any, any distinctions on fracture risk and fracture prevention. Let's come to the BUBS 2 study. The BUBS 1 study we, we published last year in the JCM, and the BUBS 2 study uh, had two study arms, and we also included males in the study. We had um, the non-intervention group, we had females and males, uh, the two types of operation, and they did not get anything. Like in the BUBS 1 study, uh, nothing. And on the other hand, we, we discussed how, how to change the lifestyle and to, to prevent bone loss in a, a, an easy approach. Um, we, we made a supplementation of vitamin D, of 25 hydroxy vitamin D, prior to the operation, because the median vitamin D level was 60 nanogram per milliliter, so we made an eight-week uh, loading time with 28,000 units uh, per week. Then it was the operation, and then to maintain physiological vitamin D levels, we supplemented 16,000 units per week. We supplemented calcium monocytrate. We did not use calcium carbonate; we used calcium monocytrate. It's known, it is known that calcium monocytrate is better for patients uh, after bariatric surgery who just have a small pouch. Uh, it's better for, uh, it's less body pain. We made together with our colleagues from the, from the Department of Physical Exercise specific program and in order to, to lower the, the well-known loss of lean mass, we also added uh, a weight-adjusted protein supplementation, and also the study endpoint was at 24 months. Here is the baseline characteristics of the study population, very, very common to the, the BUBS-1 study, and so the, the only difference between the two groups of baseline was due to the vitamin D loading uh, of 28,000 units per week over eight weeks, we were able to to increase uh, the vitamin D level towards the normal level compared to the non-intervention group. That's the only reason why here's a significant difference at baseline between the two study populations. And now you can see here in blue the intervention group and in red the non-intervention group. We were able to lower the well-known increase of sclerostin levels in the intervention group here represented by the blue lines. At DCOP1, we did not observe significant differences. Also in CTX levels, although the, the horizontal dotted line indicates the upper limit of normal, we were able to lower the increase, but we were not able 
to stop the increase of CTX activity. In P1 and P, it's a quite similar pattern. We were able to, to lower a little bit the activity of PM1 PD increase and to a lesser extent compared to the non intervention group. PDH levels clearly came down into the medium range of normal. This might be caused by a structured preoperative vitamin D and postoperative vitamin D supplementation. And as you can see here, this is the range of normal here is between 20 and 30. And we were able to maintain levels close to 30 but below 40, not to uh, produce any probable unfavorable effects via a vitamin D over supplementation. Uh, body, min bone mineral density, lumbar spine, total hip. There was a decline in both groups, but the decline was to a lesser extent in the intervention group. And also in the total body BMT, there was a lesser decline. And lean body mass, there was a, a downgrading of these values, but also not to that extent when compared to the non-intervention group. Again, here you can see there is a decline in, in total body BMT, but reflected by the lesser increases of bone turnover markers and sclerostin markers, uh, you have a lesser decrease of bone mineral density of the total body of the whole skeleton. And this is what most of the patients don't want to realize when they will have their bariatric surgery. They need structured meals at least five times a day. They have to drink water before they try to eat, otherwise they have to vomit and regurgitation. Uh, they have tea, they, have, they need special bread, special cheese, and they need protein powder without flavors in order to get enough protein. And we, we made uh, the protein supplementation based on the Harris Benedict formula. And this formula is really a very old formula. It was published in the US in 1918, so nothing new. We just thought together with our colleagues from the Department of Dietary and Supplementation what to do, how to, how to improve all this. Um, yeah, it is interesting for if you look. Um, the total intake of calories is only 1,400. Even with all our, our efforts and our approaches to, to bring these patients towards normal nutrition, uh, it's below 1,500 calories. So it's clear that these patients will lose their body weight over time and there's an ongoing loss of body weight. Uh, I already mentioned my first talk in the morning that the trabecular bone score, the new soft application for, for DXA measurements, uh, also reflects bone trabecular microarchitecture. And we were able to show that it is in the, in the multifactorial intervention in, this, in the blue group, uh, that the loss of TBS values could be diminished. We could not stop it, but we were able to, to lower it compared to here. And after 6 and 18 and 24 months, we had significant differences between the two groups reflected by trabecular bone score. What are our conclusions? We clearly address all patients to perform a vitamin D loading prior to bariatric surgery. We recommend an ongoing vitamin D supplementation, a calcium monosulfate supplementation, at least 1,000 milligrams per day, but not at once. This 1,000 milligram tablet should be put in at least four pieces or four times a day. Uh, body mass index adjusted protein supplementation, we use the Harris Benedict formula as a, a very old approach, but it should work. In combination with aerobic physical exercise, um, it's a change of lifestyle, and you have to educate these patients because an, an obese patient never made any, any physical exercise, and even prior to the operation, but at least after the operation, all these patients should immediately start with aerobic physical exercise. It started with Nordic walking, with swimming, muscle exercise underwater, and just to increase um, the, the motivation of these patients to work with their body. And altogether, the multifactorial approach, in this multifactorial approach, we were able to show that this decelerates. It cannot stop, but it decelerates the loss of aerial BMD and lean body mass. As I showed you in the, in the graphs, the increase of bone turnover markers and the decrease of aerial BMD in the trabecular bones were less pronounced in the intervention group. 
regardless of the method of surgery. And we conclude that the supplementation takes a positive effect on long-term outcomes in bone protection of the bariatric surgery. And we clearly recommend with our data this should be put into national and international guidelines for patients uh, undergoing bariatric surgery. Since we know that the number of patients, not only in Austria, but also worldwide, is increasing by at least 10% per year, and there is a new patient population that we as medical doctors have to deal with. So, still is the question that should be answered. We have a decline with a loss in bone mineral density. We have an increase in bone and over marker. But we are not sure whether this, or whether it not, uh, reflects an increased fracture risk, an increased fragility fracture risk of the bariatric surgery. Katrin Rousseau, um, she is from Canada, and I had the great pleasure and opportunity. I was um, uh, in the, at the ASBMR meeting 2015 in Seattle, uh, at the uh, US West Coast. Uh, I heard her, her talk, and they made a real, real big study in, in the province of Quebec in Canada, and they looked to 12, more than 12,000 women undergoing bariatric surgery compared to 38,000 obese uh, and 126 non-obese uh, subjects. They looked on diverse primary comorbidities and they looked especially on, on osteoporotic fracture risk after bariatric surgery. On the left side of the slide you see a forest plot and to the right side you see deleterious effects of bariatric surgery concerning fracture types. And you can see here the non-obese group, the obese group, and here the third one in the row is the bariatric surgical group. We have an increase of pelvis, of hip and femoral fractures. This is clearly in line with data I showed you in the morning from our, our paper that is currently under review, that we very often underestimate the effect of, of femoral fractures and of pubic fractures. And you can see here it has a bariatric surgery clearly has an effect on a fracture risk in these anatomical regions and also here in the upper limb. If you can see here, you see that over the years after the operation, the number of patients with fracture is increasing, the fracture of survival decreases. This you can see at the, the, the lower limb, at the pelvis, at the upper limb, and also here not very good shown at uh, the vitreal body. The authors also showed in their publication, this was uh, published in July 2016, a couple of weeks ago, they could show that after four years after the fracture, after bariatric surgery, the number of uh, fractures, of rigidity fractures, increases. And they also stated that there is a shift, a shift of a fracture pattern, typically for obese patients, force towards a fracture pattern of osteoporosis. And remember, and if you go back in the slide, what was the mean age of this population? Like in our population, it was about 40. Which means they are at the half time of their life. They have another four decades of life and they will sustain fractures four years, beginning four years after the bariatric surgery. Another striking argument for healthcare providers is bariatric surgery will help us to reduce healthcare costs. We will have lower cardiovascular problems, we will have lower dyslipidemia, uh, we will have lower type 2 diabetes, we will have a lower number of operations with hip prosthesis, knee prosthesis, knee arthroplasty, something like this. Uh, these are the most common arguments why health care providers, why social systems, why, why um, states focus on bariatric surgery as one attempt to, to lower the cost. Okay, so what's the story behind? Bariatric surgery and health care costs from the United States, the same distribution, about 75-80% male, it was published in the JAMA surgery three years ago. The typical pattern of, of age from 30 to 45 years, so the majority of people are between uh, 30 and 60. This is also my personal opinion in Austria. And you can see 50% uh, of the people had 
hypertension and a quarter of the patients had type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disorders, but also uh, vascular disorders. The question now that arises is, do these healthcare costs really go down? Do we have any benefit if you just look at the costs of healthcare systems? And the answer is no. Uh, here, panel A, the total costs, one was the value prior to the operation. And if you would argue that you have a decline of healthcare costs covering everything from medication, from uh, Visits to a general practitioner, visit to hospital, etc. I showed you that there is a need for a lot of endoscopic procedures for dilation of strictures in the upper esophagus. Um, it should go down. It goes up. It goes up over the years. B. Inpatient costs. That should be also here. Go down below one. It goes up. It goes up. The inpatient cost in hospital is increasing. Uh, panel C. Professional and office costs also increasing these people. They need a lot of visits to the doctors. They have problems. We still don't know how to handle all these problems. And the cost for pharmacy, they also increase. So taken together, we cannot say that bariatric surgery is very costly, a cost-effective method over years. Let me conclude my talk. Uh, bariatric surgery does not reduce the overall healthcare cost in the long term. And there is no evidence that any type of surgery is more likely to reduce our health care costs. To assess the value of bariatric surgery, we should focus on further studies that will bring any light behind the potential benefit of improved health and well-being of persons uh, undergoing the procedure rather than cost savings. Um, I tried to show you what do we know in 2016. I know that there's an increasing number of patients. We still don't, are not aware how to deal with these patients. Uh, we cannot know, and we can, I cannot answer the question today, but we in five or 10 years with a number of patients that is increasing by 10% per year. I was able to show you that, that they have a lot of problems, that they need uh, a structured multifactorial approach, at least to show that their bone metabolism, that their bone health can be maintained. Um, there's, the rate of fracture increases approximately four years after the operation, towards a clear pattern for osteoporosis fractures, and also the healthcare costs increase. With this, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Christian. It's, it's, it's interesting and surprising that people, that people are fracturing their bones rather late. Does that mean that it's very natural? <laughs> <laughs> well, before it, I'm this, allow me the, the same gift to you all that nice and beautiful Romania for our guest. Thank you very much. A very generous gift. You are speaking so, so fast to, to, to my request to bring you here such uh, quite interesting news. <laughs> Romania are interested in that it's not there, right? They, we have a clinic. How many clinics do we have in Vienna for bariatric surgery? We have at least four clinics, and at our clinics we have approximately 180 operations per year. So this would mean that most of the Vienna schools are going to go their bone? Probably, yes. So, no, that's good news. But why do you think it's rather late to start fracturing? You said after four years. Yeah. Well, um, I was, sorry, I was expecting them to grow their bones earlier because they fly more easily. They are more active because they lost so much. Well, in fact, they are not more active. We think that they are more active. They lose muscle. They lose lean mass. Uh, they do not change their lifestyle. They don't change their no, lifestyle. No, 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 no. It's wonderful. It's not worth also, the, the, num the number of, of, of psychiatric medication is still high. So they, they have a lot of SSRIs and they keep on S being on SSRI. Um, they, they are very rather young, the mean age is 40, since they have a high initial bone mass. So maybe they have, they have a profit or a good budget when they start after the operation, but for years it's, it's not long. So they don't Normally not, no. Do they have a psychiatric 
Yes. We, yes. 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 They they have to come to the clinic uh, for two days. They get a complete internal checkup, gastroscopy, lab checkup, ultrasound, X-ray of the chest, ECG, uh, psychological uh, full evaluation. Yeah, but therefore you would need. Uh, more psychological evaluation after the operation, but this is not covered by the social system, so no one does it. Just ask questions. Your Oh, okay. did you measure sclerosis in Um. I read in the literature that there is an increase of 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 bone turnover marker, and at that time. Um, some publications were launched about the role of osteocytes and sclerosis as a potential new biomarker and uh, we had the possibility to get the lab kit from the Biomedicas Austrian company, very well known in, in the business for sclerosis levels and at that time we, we, we tried to measure how, how the thing started. We, in our research group there was a very young student. She was a, she, she was she was a very tough student. Okay. Uh, it's not from any other Pardon me? The person that measures sclerosis. No, no. She, she, it was an idea from a student. Ah. Yeah. It's not from a big population. No, it was, it was a student's idea. She said, I want to measure sclerosis after bariatric surgery. <laughs> and I said, okay, try it. I, I saw there is somebody in Vienna in the lab called the big population. No. I said, take care. It increases with increasing renal function. No. no. <laughs> But in fact, these people, these patients, they don't have renal problems. Uh, no. no. Just, you have a question here, Christian. If there is there any other valid alternative to gastric bypass that you recommend to a high risk patient, type two diabetes, heart disease, etc. Yeah. As a, if you have a body mass index above, let's say 50, 55, 60, bariatric surgery might be the only possibility to lose weight. I, last week, I had a patient, a male patient, age 24, with BMI of 60. He wasn't able to come into the room of my ambulance. Okay, maybe this is the only possibility. But if you have a BMI of 40, 42, and you are at the age of 35, 40 years, I do not see any reason why not to change lifestyle, why not to start performing muscle exercise, reduce your fat consumption, and eat, look for a better, better nutrition. Like the vegan nutrition. Oh, vegan is not that good. <laughs> We have a research protein with vegan nutrition and they have uh, microstructural deteriorations. So, my adolescent rebounds. That's how Professor Abelita Dimiatza, she asked as I post my interview. I was just praising your effort. What, what, what we also know from the uh, surgic procedure in the, in the intestine, uh, it is known that there's a change in calprotectin levels. Calprotectin is a very good marker for chronic inflammatory bowel disease. And we already know that after bariatric surgery, we see a rapid ongoing increase of calprotectin levels of fecal and serum. So the gut and the bone is at an axis. And um, you, you put deep cuts into this well-known axis. So I think we still don't know where is the story going. We have two PhD projects right on um, checking if we could block uh, rank ligand uh, and look on, on, on fecal and, and serum calprotectin levels in order to, to prevent also the inflammation of the gut and the problem link to the bone axis. That's true. Hey, <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christian. It was beautiful to have you here. And if you could involve us in something, we are ready to be involved everywhere.